Welcome to Gardening and Beyond. I'm Lee Reeder. Composting is a way to keep vegetable waste out of landfills. But what about all the other stuff we want to discard? Kelly Bell joins us from a group dedicated to reusing or recycling everything. The Master Recycler Program was established in 2000 and is supported by Lane County Waste Management as part of its commitment to community-based waste prevention education. Kelly has been the program's coordinator since 2008. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So you are a master recycler. Um, are, do you have any other master titles? No, just the one. <laughs> well, that's enough. Keeps me busy, yes. <laughs> so tell us, what is the Master Recycler Program? How does all this work? Well, the way I like to uh, talk to people is that there are lots of different types of volunteer commitments that require specialized training. For example, if you want to be on the ski patrol, you need to take specialized training, often pay for it yourself. If you want to be an emergency responder and work through Red Cross uh, to respond to things like Katrina, you need specialized training. Same with Master Gardener, you need specialized training and Food Preserver as well. So Master Recyclers go through uh, their version of specialized training in order to uh, have enough deep background to be able to help their neighbors take the next step in waste prevention. So there is a public education component to what you are doing? Primarily what we are uh, about is recruiting and training uh, waste prevention educators, volunteer waste prevention ed educators. There is a small percentage of uh, students who are sent by their employer uh, so that they can enhance uh, resource conservation in the workplace, but the majority uh, are uh, community waste prevention educators. So would, that would be the mission and purpose. Um, I, th I think you probably have more to tell us, though, about the specifics of the program. Well, what you uh, learn when you go through the Master Cycle program is, is a real peek behind the curtain. And you see things and learn things that you didn't really even have a question for until you were there. The landfill, for example, that's a big highlight of our field trip and that's not something that people think about. They think uh, maybe that they roll their trash and recycling to the curb and then it goes away. <laughs> well, we take you to a place called Away. <laughs> uh, the final resting place of all of the trash uh, for Lane County. Um, the landfill accepts 225,000 tons of trash every year. And it's all in one place now. Uh, that's in Goshen. And we take folks to see that. And it's an engineering marvel. It's not just a hole in the ground. It, there's a lot that goes into it. But it... Uh, yeah, landfills have to have a liner, among other things, do. right? They yeah, do. They do. And not just a, you know, piece of plastic. The liner of a landfill cell is as thick as I am tall, like five and a half feet. That's the total... Uh, thickness of the actual liner and all the different wow. uh, components that go into it. So yeah, it's uh, engineered for safety to uh, preserve the safety of our water, our air, um, and the soil. So I, I know you have a presentation on this. Why don't you walk us through that? Okay. Well, the first peek behind the curtain is uh, the very first class. And we uh, share with folks how our local system works. Um, communities have a lot in common in terms of how uh, trash and recycling moves around or doesn't, but there are things that are very specific to each community. For example, in our community, um, Lane County is a waste shed. Every county in Oregon is, just about. Uh, our county is the size of Connecticut in terms of square miles. So it's a lot of ground to cover in order to provide um, the type of service that we're used to providing. So we have tr a system of transfer stations. So if somebody comes and talks about that, our uh, superintendent of operations comes and talks about that on the first night. Uh, we uh, give people an idea about um, household hazardous waste and how that should be handled and how it can be handled. Um, and also our waste prevention program. So the first night is just jam-packed 
with um, information about Lane County Waste Management Division in particular. Mm -hmm. And you've got some slides to show us, uh, right? Well, the slide number three just shows the speakers, the, the faces of the speakers. And uh, these folks love what they do. Um, they love their jobs, and they also love talking to master recyclers. And all of our speakers say that. All of our presenters say that. They love coming to talk to master recyclers. Because uh, everyone that um, visits our class does have some uh, responsibility for public education, but they know mass recyclers are paying keen attention, and they're going to help them get their messages out to the community as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, but I, I know you've got more in your presentation. Um, oh, that's just, that's just <laughs> class one. We have nine <laughs> classes. Um, we also hear from a local waste hauler. So if we're in Eugene um, for the class, then Santa Pack will come and talk about commingle in particular. Santa Pack is our, our local one waste, of the, uh, one, one of, of the local waste collection uh, organizations. Right. If we go to Florence, then we'll use um, one of the Florence haulers as the speaker. But we'll also hear from um, the overarching uh, organization that, that oversees uh, waste and pol you know issues around pollution and um, waste management, materials yeah. management, and that's Oregon DEQ. So Craig Phillip comes and uh, represents De that organization. Department of Environmental Quality, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Um, so people get a, a little bit confused about uh, what can and can't be recycled, and we talk about what can be recycled at the curb, what can be recycled at a transfer station, if you live in a small town, what may be able to be recycled in our community if you have a commercial business and you have some kind of off throw that's unusual, something that you wouldn't have at home, but you get a lot of at your work. Mm -hmm. So we go into all of those things. And then um, class three, if we want to just go in order. Well, that's the rural. Um, now, before I go there, let's, let's talk about Carol, and she's uh, si slide six. I don't, could could I, we have slide six, please? I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have, even though recycling is free, we have quite an illegal dumping problem in Lane County. And even after uh, TVs became free to recycle, we were seeing many TVs left on sides of roads, left in creeks. And I just, I don't understand it. But we have someone to, to deal with that problem, and her name is Carolyn Francis. And she goes out when she gets a call from a resident that someone has dumped a load of whatever, trash and recycling, usually, uh, on the side of a county road. And so it's her responsibility to investigate um, the dump. So um, she takes photographs. She looks for evidence. Evidence will be things like mail prescription bottles. So uh -huh. on some occasions she can write a ticket and the ticket can be as high as $2,000. This is so America's <laughs> dumbest polluter. So are they, leave, kind of they leave their name and address. <laughs> it kind of is. But, but, but um, one, of the, one of the challenges with that is it's often uh, it's, it's somebody else's mail. They've paid someone to, to take a load to the dump for them and that didn't happen. So oh. you, you really want to be sure to get a receipt before you pay anybody to take your stuff away. Wow, mm. I hadn't thought of that. Also, when you see uh, stuff on the side of the road, if you go by the second day, you'll see more. Kind of, kind of like that Arlo Guthrie song. Well, did, we had stuff to dump, and we saw something, you know, pile on the side of the road. And rather than bring that pile up, we threw another pile down. And <laughs> in the song, he does get uh, identified by male and circles and arrows. On the back of photographs, it's really cute. It's Carolyn hadn't heard that song, but I got it a CD just because it really describes her job in so many ways. So I guess the point we want to make here is there are places where you can take such items like TVs or I guess old mattresses, perhaps. Well, there is a charge for mattresses, but they will get they will get recycled. Uh, I think you could probably take them for free to St. Vincent de Paul, but really those kinds of details and more are covered in the class and we will have our next class on September 8th. It goes for nine weeks. We meet every Tuesday night for nine weeks in a row. It's a three hour lecture Q&A um, format 
And then uh, we also, during that period of time, we attend um, multi-site field trips. And one of the requirements for master cyclers, uh, you may be interested to know, is attendance at a compost demonstration. Oh. So they get to meet compost uh, specialists in the mm -hmm. nature of, in the course of this training. So mm -hmm. maybe that's why there's so much crossover. Okay, so let's say a concerned member of the public mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily want to become a master recycler, but would like to know all of the recycling rules. Mm -hmm. I assume there's a, a good website for well, that. If you go to lanecounty.org and use the search term recycle, you'll see, you'll find all kinds of, um, well, a lot of detailed information. Mm -hmm. Also, if you go to the Oregon DEQ website, you'll find lots of information about rules and regulations. Okay, good. So what's next? Um, we get quite a bit into the details around plastic and paper. Paper is, um, in our community, the paper that gets recycled locally is cardboard. So most of the cardboard that is collected in Lane County goes straight over to the cardboard plant in Springfield and is recycled into new um, components of cardboard. Mm -hmm. Plastic can be confusing for folks and we dedicate uh, almost an entire class to the issues of plastic. And master cyclers are invited to come back and attend classes again, uh, second time, third time if they like, and we always have guests who've already gone through the program when we um, teach the plastics class. So you're saying it's possible to audit the class if you've already been through it before, just mm -hmm. as a refresher course? Absolutely. That's a great idea. Uh, we have several waste-based businesses in our area that we're very proud of. Um, Let's see that slide. What that's is that? number eight. Let's see slide number eight, please. So uh, two of the speakers that come and talk to us are Terry McDonald from St. Vincent de Paul and also Ian Hill from Sequential Biofuels. Are you familiar with Sequential? I am. They um, are an amazing company. They sell fuel at the retail level, but they also make fuel. So they have a fuel refinery. They make biodiesel, and they basically make diesel from discards. They make mm -hmm. it from used cooking oil, and they also have a business where they collect used cooking oil. Um, is that mostly collected from restaurants, or do they get it from homeowners? It's a combination. I know one of their big accounts is Kettle Chips. Mm -hmm. But yes, they um, go around to restaurants um, all over our area and even beyond. This is getting a little bit off subject, but how readily available is that fuel once it's been converted from old uh, used oil? What do you mean? Meaning... Uh, well, they sell it in two places here in town. There's the station on McVay Highway and also on 18th. So, yeah. It's so as long as you have uh, a vehicle that will take that fuel, then there are places locally where you can get it. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. But they don't just sell diesel. They also sell um, regular gas. I have a regular gas car and I go there all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to sound like a commercial. It's hard, <laughs> it's hard not to when you talk about the waste-based businesses, but really it's amazing um, the example that these folks give of, of mining the waste stream. And Terry, Terry McDonald is just a phenomenal example. They're recycling mattresses into a number of products. Um, they capture um, propane and C, uh, from propane tanks and CFC gas from refrigerators that they're going to recycle. Um, they have a glass foundry. Terry McDonald is the name of a company or the he individual who the runs? the executive director of St. Vincent de Paul Society ah, okay. of Lane County. I did not know that St. Vincent de Paul was capturing propane out of appliances. Well, you have to be sort of certified to handle certain types of things and um, CFC gas in particular um, is a hazard and so they're um, certified to do that and they capture the gas, they clean the gas and then they sell it on the secondary market for people who have um, classic cars and that sort of thing that mm -hmm. require that older material. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, master recycler is the term and yes we do talk about recycling but we're not going to recycle our way into a healthier planet. Um, if someone asks me about recycling, I often try to find out if they will stay and listen and um, open their mind to ways to reduce waste in the first place. 
Because once uh, we've had to recycle something, it's already too late to reduce the waste. If we look upstream, um, we can make a bigger impact. And um, midway through the class, we really um, get to brass tacks about that. There's a couple who took the class. Um, when we first started the program in Lane County, uh, Dale and Sandy, Dale Luganbell and Sandy Aldridge, and they just are gr great examples. They, um, you have a picture of them, don't yes, you? Yes, and that's on slide Somewhere. nine. We were just at their home. They built their home in Saginaw. It's beautiful. They built it with their own two hands. They didn't have it built. They built their home. Um, they grow 90% uh, of their food. And they're just really great living examples of how to live well uh, and uh, be able to withdraw from um, work for pay, be independent of work, not winning the lottery, uh, just changing the way they live, changing primarily the level at which they consume, which is greatly reduced from the average American. And so um, they give, give us ideas about how they've done it um, and what the impact of uh, an American's lifestyle versus another citizen's, another world citizen's lifestyle and, and things that, that we can do to kind of detach from mindless consuming and mindless spending. And generating waste mm -hmm, thereby. Exactly. And, and that's primarily on the personal level. Uh, and then we hear from Carolyn Stein with Rethink Business, and she um, talks about business resource conservation. And, and she comes from the point of view, uh, which makes sense for all of us, I think, that if you're reducing waste, you're also reducing costs, and that can be very attractive to businesses. So um, she helps um, folks who are, who are trying to reduce costs and reduce waste, uh, take, take them through a series of steps, and if um, they're successful and willing, uh, to accomplish some of these, then um, they get certified as a Rethink Business, um, they get some marketing support, and uh, uh, lower expenses. Who provides the marketing support? Bring does, and it's a free service to businesses, but it's financially supported. That, that program is financially supported by eWeb, by Lane, um, uh, Lane County Waste Management, and also um, City of Eugene. This kind of reminds me of a point I um, was thinking of earlier. You mentioned that y you sounded like a commercial talking uh, about, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. We don't have any problem with calling attention or giving free advertising to businesses that are doing great things for the community. Well, and we also want to support businesses to do great things because mm -hmm. businesses have enormous, an enormous impact on the waste stream. Mm -hmm. um, one figure that Carolyn... Uh, used to cite is that only 40% of municipal solid waste is generated by residents. 60% is generated by businesses. So it's very important to pay attention to what businesses are doing and help support them yeah. in doing better. Yeah, definitely. So you talked about compost uh, when we first got started. And compost is part of waste reduction. And uh, mm -hmm. we do do some um, quite a bit of compost training and education for master recyclers. In fact, in other um, parts of the country where they have mass recycler programs, sometimes they're called mass recycler composter, and they do two things. They, they become compost specialists and mass recyclers together. Well, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it can. It mm. can. Um, but we have a, a really robust compost specialist program already, and we take advantage of uh, those trained compost specialists, one in particular, Rodney Bloom. Um, He's well known to us here. And a favorite, <laughs> a huge <laughs> he, favorite. He, isn't he a lovely person? Yes, yes <laughs> I like is. him very much. Very enthusiastic. He's a great instructor. Uh, he inspires a lot of folks to do vermicomposting uh, when it hadn't occurred to them mm -hmm. until they met him. Um, so he talks about um, backyard composting, and then he goes into depth about vermicomposting. And like I said, very inspirational, very encouraging. Um, you know, basically lets, anybody, lets folks know that anybody can do it, and lots of people try. So, I think that's a lot of fun. Yeah, you've got a picture of him. Let's, let's see, let's see uh, slide, slide 10. 10. That's the Rodney with uh, a worm bin that he made from pallet wood. He likes to bring this because it's a, uh, something made from scrap, which we always love. We didn't get, uh, we didn't get slide 10. I'm not sure why. There he is. There's Rodney. 
Yeah, Rodney was on the show um, a month or two ago mm -hmm. and uh, wowed us all with talking his talk of various composting methods. Yeah, yeah, he's a special guy. Um, Lane County Waste Management and our businesses aren't the only actors involved in um, waste prevention in our area. City of Eugene has a huge role to play, and we do hear from City of Eugene when we're doing the class here. Uh, currently, uh, the person that comes to speak to us, her name is Stephanie Scappa, who's also Master Cycler. Many of our presenters are, by the way, have become Master Cyclers. Stephanie is one. She is uh, with the City of Eugene's Waste Prevention and Green Building Program, and in particular, she is the lead on the new um, commercial food waste collection program called Love Food Not Waste. Oh, yeah, yeah. So she um, helps uh, businesses get started uh, with that program and talks about the other um, waste prevention um, programs that the city has as well. So she comes to, s to speak, and then there's a uh, gentleman named Alex Kyler who has been involved in several different uh, aspects of waste prevention with a focus on compost but what he comes to talk to us about is more related to his new position and that is as um, the um, legislative analyst for Lane County so he's actually our lobbyist and he got interested in lobbying when he was working at City of Eugene and got very interested in trying to uh, improve the bottle bill. So as a member of Association of Oregon Recyclers, having worked at Bring Recycling, now he was at City of Eugene, uh, involved with uh, waste and recycling. Um, he really enjoyed that piece. He really enjoyed uh, going to Salem, so he says, and uh, now he does that full time for Lane County. So he talks to us about waste prevention legislation over the years and what's coming up. But he also gives us a little primer on um, how to pass a bill, which if you are interested in waste prevention um, on a legislative level, you would be interested in. So we appreciate that. He's got a, a very unique background and then to be able to give us that piece too because we can, we can recycle and we can do what we can do on a local level but uh, the way Alex talks about it is that with a stroke of a pen, big changes can happen. So if there are those of us that are willing to work on the legislative level, we can get um, large things done in a hurry. It always has to go hand in hand. The, yes. the local work and the state level work and even usually federal level as well. Mm -hmm. you, you have to work them all yes. concurrently. Yes, yes, yes. So where people see Master Cyclers a lot uh, is probably at events. And I get calls all the time. Um, oh, I saw Master Cyclers at this event. How can I get them to help me at my event? Um, so we do talk about event recycling and, and in Lane County in particular and some Master Cycler programs in Southern Oregon, um, we put a special emphasis on event recycling. Because um, I think it's very confusing uh, to go to an event and not have the same recycling opportunity that I have at home. And if you don't provide that for folks, then uh, things fall apart. So uh, we try to support that in Lane County with the free Recycle Bin Loan Program. And then also uh, for some events, if they're interested, um, recruiting master recycler volunteers to assist them. So you're talking about something as simple as having a bin for waste paper products and a bin for glass bottles and that kind of thing. Well, yeah, bottles and jugs, bottles and bottles, um, beverage, like plastic beverage containers, metal beverage containers, and then separate from trash. What we also are trying to encourage events to do, and I know Festival Latina coming up, Latino coming up is... Uh, going to do is to capture that food waste as well mm -hmm. and make sure that that either gets composted or um, that it is um, captured for animal feed hmm. so that it's not wasted. Great. Good news. Master Cyclers don't all have to be public speakers but some are called upon um, to speak to groups that they're already involved in and we do want to address that. So we have someone come who happens to work for, this, for the city of Eugene, but she's also a member of Toastmasters International. 
And so she oh, comes That's in. handy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. And so when we go and if we teach a class in a rural area, we try to find a local Toastmaster to do that part mm -hmm. for that class as well. So we also address those things. And that's just the classes. We also go on lots of field trips, and that's fun too. <laughs> do, you, do you have things to tell us about that? Or um, have, are, are you done with this portion? Well, or? well the landfill is very popular. Well, then let's hear about it. Uh, the landfill is popular. Rexius is popular. I don't know if I want to go into a lot of detail. Um, and just in case somebody further afield is watching, what is Rexius? Rexius is a local um, commercial composter. We also go to Next Step Recycling. We also go to Bring Recycling. Mm -hmm. um, if we have enough interest, we also go to the Aurora Glass Foundry. So. Mm. Um, these are places that people wouldn't ordinarily go for a tour. It wouldn't occur to them to go. But um, the people that are attracted to the Master Cycler program are very keen to visit these, these places. So this is all part of the training? It is. And something new that we're doing this year is uh, we're going paperless. Very exciting. Um, my supervisor, the Waste Prevention Specialist, Sarah Grimm, and uh, Waste Prevention Specialists all over Oregon got together and for several years, they were developing, helping to develop an OSU online course called Recycling 101. And it's modeled after Master Recycler courses throughout Oregon. We've all shared materials throughout the years and helped other programs get started. Others helped us get started. Uh, and so Recycling 101 was built in a similar way. So it's an online course that you can take independent of the Master Recycler class, but now what we've decided to do is use Recycle 101 as our manual. So uh, for the first time, as people go through the class, they're going to have the live lecture uh, Q&A series and the field trips, and they'll also have um, the online course uh, to do as well. That's, that, that all sounds great, <laughs> especially going paperless. I mean, yes. that's just so progressive. Well, it's, it's a little, gives me a little chagrin when I print out manuals and hand them out to master recyclers and looking to make sure I double sided and <laughs> I widen the margins. And I have the oh, same issue. No when more I, stress. Whenever about I that. print something at home, I, <laughs> I always feel kind of guilty about it. But then I think, well, I can always shred this and compost it. There you go. There which, you go. which I'm actually quite diligent about. But I'm, I'm a composter. Do you know, any, based on what I've said, do you know anybody who sounds like they should be a master recycler? Send them my way. <laughs> Send them my way. Yeah, I mean, nobody comes to mind specifically, but I can imagine that, that this would appeal mm -hmm. to a lot of people. Oh, it because does. it's the kind of thing that you can immediately implement just in your daily life. All ages, working, not working. We get a lot of teachers and retired teachers mm -hmm. that are very attracted to the class. It sounds great. It is. It is. It changed my life. It really did. It changed my focus. I mean, I've always been interested in volunteers in particular, the passion of volunteers. Um, what volunteers give is special and priceless. And the fact that um, people come specifically to learn these things uh, to help other people prevent waste is very unique, I think. Well, it's one way that we can maybe try to preserve kind of the beauty of this area, uh, just, just by generating less yes. stuff. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And you've been doing this since 2007? Do I, is that when you became a Master Recycler? I became a Master Recycler in uh, fall of 2007. Mm -hmm. And then I started in the position. Um, it just happened to come open while I was taking the class. So I was very fortunate. Uh, I started in the position in uh, December of 2007. And the first class I helped with was our very first rural class, which was in Cottage Grove. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of fun. It was the first time we had taken a full length class to a rural community. And we've done that several times and we'll probably do it again in the future. Good stuff. What's next? Well, what do, what do Master Recyclers do? I mean, what, 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 are, what are we talking to folks about? What would you ask a Master Recycler yourself? I would say, um, what, what can be recycled? Can, or can this, if you have whatever this is, can mm -hmm. this be recycled? Yeah. I've got um, this thing, what do I do with it? Right. 
Well, um, as I said before, once something is ready to be recycled, it, it's already, it was already too late to prevent the waste in the first place. Right. Because recycling is a discard. It's not necessarily trash, unless we put it in the trash, but it's a discard nonetheless that requires some sort of end-of-life management. But if we can prevent that waste in the first place, then you don't have to recycle as much, mm -hmm. which would be a lot more fun, I think. Um, so what we try to get folks to think about, especially with plastic packaging, when you think about plastic packaging, can this be recycled? No. Is it a box? No. Um, let's think about how we can um, not bring it home. What are some solutions that we can think of to not bring this home. You know, one dilemma I have is, is that organic spinach comes in a plastic box. I can't recycle that. Non-organic spinach comes in a bag. I can recycle that. Can That's just organic. so unfair. It's unfair. <laughs> Those kinds of choices are, are unfair. It's true. Um, there should be a little more uniformity around packaging to make that choice less not so much a, a lesser that, of two evils. Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh. So, in order to avoid it, what do you do? You grow your spinach, right? Right. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> you grow your spinach. It's ready to harvest as we there speak. There you go. There you go. Or I would trade somebody for spinach. I would do something for them and trade them for spinach. I'm not, I'm not a gardener. I'm not going to get that. That's a great idea, though. Mm -hmm. Trading for food. Mm -hmm. Like in the old days. Absolutely. Barter. Absolutely. So we bring back a barter system in order to reduce generating stuff that's going to go into the landfill. There's a up, 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 uh, upscale term for that now. It's called the sharing economy. Mm, that's right. That so is the latest term. That is the latest term. It's just putting a new label on a very old uh, standard idea. I think it's a great one. It is. So uh, I've, we've had various campaigns uh, over the years. Uh, I talk about um, waste-free holidays every year. Uh, around the holidays. Um, several summers we've talked about um, zero waste back to school, trying to get people to detach from, are you familiar with the list? No. The list. Um, there's n a new ritual, well, it's about 20 years old now, um, where someone puts out a list for every single grade of the school supplies that a child needs. Okay, I've seen those lists. Those are the lists. That's like the pens, list. pencils, notebooks. Right, yeah. right. Um, I my son's 24 years old, and I'm still finding ty you know Ticonderoga pencils and reams of paper, you know, left over from the list. So um, we do. We try to talk to folks about uh, thinking about what you have on hand, not being kind of a slave to the list. Talking with your teachers. Are all these things really necessary? Are these things you're asking for? Is there another way we can do this? Um, and also, you know, do all supplies have to be brand new? Mecca is uh, one of my favorite waste-based businesses, and they actually sell art supplies, crayons, you know, that sort of thing. So uh, when you're getting ready for school, not everything has to be brand new. Go to St. Vincent de Paul. Sometimes you'll even find higher quality clothing if you buy used. So in this way, you're preventing um, that signal to go up the chain and say, make another sweater, make another sweater, if you go and get it at the thrift store. Same with the pencils. So the hard part here, the challenge, is to persuade people to think differently about how they approach it. But the good news is that there are ways to save money on it and actually to save some time and effort. Maybe you've got the notebook already stashed in a drawer somewhere, right. you don't have to go and buy another one. Right. Or a partial one will do. You just pull out mm -hmm. the old pages. Um, it really does require us to stop and pause. And a lot of sort of drive-by shopping, um, drive-by eating, all of that stuff uh, occurs when we are rushed. Mm -hmm. And so, so much of, of preventing waste is taking a breath, really, for me. That's what it comes down to, is stopping, pausing. How important, is this an emergency? Am I having a, a note paper emergency? You know, <laughs> I mean, having some perspective. Am I having a spinach emergency? You know, 
Um, <laughs> you're, you're so right. Well, we, we're, we're in the habit of thinking of everything as an emergency. You know, yes. I must have this right this second, and right. that's usually not true. Right, right. That, that's what I've had to train myself out of, really, is to just, just pause, just to slow down. Well, this would be a relief to, to everyone. Everyone that you approach with this way of thinking would, would in effect, go, ah, oh, thank God. <laughs> oh, I don't have to do that. It's quite a relief around the holidays. Mm -hmm. It's quite a relief around the holidays. Um, just as a, an aside, one of the things that um, I've learned and read and seen before my eyes, uh, I know people who get second jobs for the holidays, for the stuff, for the holidays. Children don't remember what they got. What children remember, as older children and as adults, what do you think it is? It's what they did and who they did it with. Spending time with relatives. I, I, um, spending time with loved ones. I remember um, I took an intern to Churchill that has a master cycle class as well in the Rachel Carson Academy. And I wanted to film their reminiscence from childhood um, early childhood holidays. And out of the 12 people we filmed, four of them talked about making cookies. <laughs> when I make cookies, every year when we make cookies, 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 that's what they remember. And, you know, if we're in the car, traveling from store to store, we're running out of time to make the cookies. And, and, and things don't have to even be perfect. You can even make a mess. Sometimes the messes are the story and are the fun part to remember. My son remembers the terrible gravy we had at a friend's um, Thanksgiving one year and he even wrote a paper about it and got a good grade. <laughs> and we talk about the bad gravy and everybody laughs, but it, it, it reminds us of a really fun time. Spending time rather than spending money. You're right. That's yeah. what I remember about holidays and, and family gatherings is what we did and who was there, yeah. who, who, we, who I spent time with. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that seems like a good lead in to Oh, this. I want to talk about Repair Cafe. Have you heard of Repair Cafes? Yes. It, um, from where did you hear about them? At the Master Gardener uh, plant sale oh, okay. in April, we had a repair, repair to reuse cafe. I was there. <laughs> I was there. Very cool. Well, where I heard about it was uh, from an article in the New York Times from 2009, there was a repair cafe movement starting in the Netherlands, and that just sounded so cool. That's where it originated, isn't it? That's the first I learned about it. That's the first I learned about it. I think that's where I read or heard that it started. But again, I mean, tinkers have been coming around farm stands for how long? I mean, Gosh, it's, forever. It's, again, it's not a new idea. It's, it's re a renewed, I guess idea. Mm -hmm. And so folks that have some skill and some time um, will make themselves available, their hands and their tools, and folks that have things that need fixed, irons and toasters and lamps, uh, and they can get things fixed or they can learn how to fix them themselves at these different cafes. And, and they, they're starting to happen all over the country and all over the world. And they take on the flavor of the interests and the capacity of their communities. So in Portland, um, there's a, a different cafe in a different place in town every couple of months. Let, let's see this slide. I believe it's X1. Oh, X1? Yeah. This, this was our very first one. This was at Mecca Material Exchange Center for Community Arts. That's an art studio right next to the train station. And um, they sell a lot of garment supplies, garment making supplies. Um, and so we asked them if they would host our inaugural Repair to Reuse Cafe, and they said yes. And so we chose sewing machines and garment repair, and it was a, a very popular event. We had, um, oh, I don't know, 150 folks come through. Wow. That included their customers. They had a really good sales day. We had uh, volunteers, professional and hobbyists. Uh, assist with repairs of sewing machines, and we had um, several um, uh, garment makers that were there to do repairs. They weren't as busy as the sewing machine folks, and the sewing machine folks were very, very busy, but 
a lot of what they were doing was was showing folks how to thread their machine properly, how to set the tension, where where you know certain places could be cleaned to make things work better. So a lot of them weren't really complicated repairs, but um, folks left very very happy and very satisfied. Oh, it's so. wonderful when you've got something that doesn't work well and you take it away and it works fine. That, that's just such a satisfying feeling. And repair is not an American. Repair is also a business. You know, if you want to support local business, fix your stuff. Mm -hmm. Get your stuff fixed. We have a um, website, repairtoreuse.org. It's a free listing. Anybody who has a repair business can be listed. Um, and you can find someone to fix your washer, fix your microwave, fix your vacuum. You know, some folks are still in the yellow pages, but not everybody. And so this is a free place where people can be listed. And that's where we got the name for the Repair Cafe, because we wanted to sort of tie the two together. Mm -hmm. So we're talking to folks at the cafes about where they can get service later, too, not just um, the day that they're there. So. Oh, service later, mm -hmm. yes. So folks that are there, some of them are professionals. They don't charge anything for their service during the cafe, but they can let people know what their rates are. They can set appointments for future work. They can give coupons, and people may come back to visit them later. So it's a way for them to generate more business and for people to learn that this, this service exists and to get something done with a, a malfunctioning item. Or goodwill and awareness. I mean, it, it, you know, um, this is the sewing machine business that was represented. So if you're going through the phone book, oh, th these are the people that worked at the, the volunteer at the repair cafe. I guess I'll go see them. Mm -hmm. Right? I think it's a great incentive. Um, so the, the way it works is you've got a sewing machine that mm -hmm. maybe stopped working mm -hmm. last year. Right. You don't know what to do with it, so you cart this thing in and there is a nice person there who learns or figures out what's wrong and probably is able to fix it and maybe can even show you what to do if it happens again. Is that the way it works? In, in many, well, everyone left satisfied. Some people needed repairs. Some people needed parts that weren't available, but they had good guidance about what the next step should be. Mm -hmm. But all the advice that they received and any repairs and any maintenance work that they received at the cafe was absolutely free. That's wonderful. <laughs> what a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> We've also um, had a cafe. We, I've tried to have a cafe every month. We just started this year. Um, February was at Next Step, March, uh, and that was for computers. Um, March, we, at, we were at the Many Nations Longhouse at U of O, and that one mm -hmm. was for small appliances. Um, People that like to work on stuff, mm -hmm. they really like to do it, and they like talking to each other. When we had the uh, cafe at the Longhouse, we didn't have a lot of customers. Um, maybe we didn't market it very well, or people couldn't find us. I don't know what it was, but the repairers really liked hanging out with each other and problem solving together. There was one thing that came through. It was a very um, rugged um, paper shredder. And the person that brought it had no hope that it was going to be fixed. She just thought she'd bring it on the chance because she happened to know that we were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody that was there worked on that, and it did get repaired, and it went back into service. <laughs> so they were determined. They were determined to make that work. I have a printer at home that has decided that it will only print in colored ink, not in black ink. Mm. So if I want it to print anything, I have to change the font color to red or green or something else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so is that something, do you have a, a repair to reuse cafe that would work on a printer? Well, I, we don't have one scheduled. Um, what I would refer you to is the pamphlet um, and the website um, where there are repair people um, listed if we have a cafe um, that uh, addresses electronics again, um, it will be on our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. So Repair to Reuse Cafe on Facebook is what you would search for. So stay tuned. I will definitely look into that. You can also uh, request it on the Facebook page. And if we get enough interest, we will make an effort to, to Re do that. Repair to Reuse Cafe dot org? Well, Repair uh, to Reuse Cafe is the search term for Facebook. Oh, Repair to Reuse.org is the directory of 
uh, repair businesses. Okay. So we're going to do something pretty ambitious um, this summer. Uh, I was talking to my uh, supervisor about our summer plans, our summer event plans and outreach, and she said she had the suggestion instead of talk about Repair Cafe when you do Wayne County Fair or the Heritage Fair, why don't you have Repair Cafe at the Wayne County Fair? Brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> why don't we? So we're going to do that. We're going to try that. And so we have a, a different cafe um, planned for every um, day of the fair. And I already have early commitments from at least one repairer in every category. But we're looking for more. Fantastic. Yes, we're looking for more. So maybe I can get my printer fixed then. Well, we're not, electronics <laughs> isn't on the menu, unfortunately. Oh, or, oh or I thought printer, you said... Printers are not. Printers are not. Oh, uh, okay. Home appliances, well, you know what? Stay tuned. Why don't you ask that question on the website? And if we can identify someone who for the small appliance and power tool day, which is on, I believe that's Thursday, if we can identify someone who can work on that type of electronic, um, well, we'll let you know. Okay. So friend us on Facebook and ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll be uh, working on garments and jewelry the first day, um, home appliances and power tools. On Thursday, Friday is going to be super popular. It's going to be bicycles. Saturday, sewing machines. And Sunday, uh, we're going to focus on hand tools. The one that we had at the Master Gardener plant sale was bicycles and garden tools. Mm -hmm. And that, too, was very popular. Yeah, I think um, the bike folks said they saw about 20 bicycles. Yeah, I remember watching all of them coming and going. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And, of course, all the gardeners were totally excited about bringing in gardening tools that were had seen better days that that was fun too and uh, the other um, kind of guest tablers we had presenters we had um, have you heard about the toolbox project mm -mm. that's another fun waste prevention uh, plan that I am excited about uh, there are a couple of uh, women who have started a tool lending library and hopefully it'll be online this summer where you can borrow a sewing machine, you can borrow a power tool. Oh, how and cool! Check it out like you would check it out at the library, and maybe pay a, a minimal fee for your tool library card. Uh, but they were um, accepting tool donations and uh, signing people up as members uh, during the, the Master Gardener plant sale as well. So I hope I hope to have them at our booth as well. That's fantastic! Isn't that a great idea? That's wonderful. That's that's happened in the past in uh, less formal ways uh, in years past, I've been told. But this will be um, first one library that'll be stationed in a friendly neighborhood, but what their hope is, is to have branch libraries in neighborhoods so that people are walking or biking distance from their neighborhood. Tool library. I used to live in a co-op when my son was young, and I loved the fact that we had one set of tools. And when I moved um, into a cul-de-sac, a neighbor approached me about going in on a lawnmower, four of us, four families. And that made perfect sense to me. And then, of course, till I took my lawn out. But <laughs> sharing tools is a great idea. I, I read a statistic, and take this with a grain of salt, but the statistic I read about power drills was that a power drill uh, is used for nine the average power drill in the average garage, whatever that is, is used for nine clock minutes in its useful life. Really? I can't back that up. It sounds preposterous, but I do know there are a lot of power tools that are just sitting, 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 when they couldn't hmm. be used. So. Well, I have a power drill that I use on a regular basis. I'm sure it, it passed nine minutes many years ago. Well, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> what are you fixing? What are you hanging? What are you doing? I, um, I build things. Oh, excellent. Uh, I Mostly outdoor things. Well, maybe we could recruit you when we have a uh, repair cafe for furniture or other wood things. Uh, we want to uh, go to the Campbell Center that has a wood shop. So something related to wood. We don't know quite yet, but stay tuned for that one, too.
Yeah, I wouldn't call myself any kind of expert. You know, I'm still quite a novice at all of it, but you know, what I do is good enough for my, my use. Well, you can be helpful and encouraging, and I think that um, our folks that are repairers that are hobbyists are sort of a bridge, too. Oh, look, I can do it. I can try it. You know, it gives folks courage. Well, that I would be more than willing to help with. Um, I, I know that a lot of people have expressed surprise that I do any kind of woodworking or carpentry at all, and, and probably that's because I'm a woman, but it may just be because men and women feel like, oh, it's beyond me. I, I could never learn those skills. So I figure if I can do it, anybody can. Well, I think uh, we're no longer as multi-skilled as we once were. I remember looking around um, outside my apartment one time when I was a young woman and thinking, I don't know my neighbors, and I only do one thing, which was sell something, and I pay for every other good and service in my life. And it didn't f I didn't feel very secure about that. And so after that awareness, I started trying to become more, more skilled and branch out. And of course, when I had my child, you know, CPR and first aid and those sorts of things uh, seemed very important. Um, when I started buying my son smart wool socks that, at REI, which imagine the price of those, uh, and wanted to keep them in service, I decided to learn to darn. So, you know, it's, it, this is fun for me. I know a lot of uh, folks that have looked at, oh, I remember darning, oh, I don't want to do that again. Well, if you see the price of smart wool socks and you want to keep them going, I mean, they're great everywhere else except for where they, they blow out, so they are worth preserving. I wouldn't do that for tube socks. Well, tell us more about this if you're ready to talk about it. Well, this is um, what I brought to the garment repair um, cafe because this is something that I learned how to do and, and one of the things that um, the internet has given us is um, a pr preservation of traditional knowledge through YouTube. Yeah. Right? So I went on, somebody asked me, do you know how to darn socks? And I went on YouTube and I saw a video and I said, yes, I know how to darn socks. And so I saw a video and I, then I saw another video and then I read some articles and then I just, then I just um, got going. So I used, to, I used to embroider and this is very similar to that in some ways. So, so you stuck a light bulb in there. That's what that was. Right? Yeah, a light bulb. Well, it looks a lot like um, a darning egg. And anytime I talk about darning, people say, "Oh, yeah, my my aunt used a light bulb," <laughs> which makes me a little nervous because incandescent light bulbs are really thin now yeah. as they're kind of sunsetting. But this is a more modern um, CFL or LED. I don't know which, and this is pretty heavy duty. Mm -hmm. But I think the the idea of the something round is so that you can uh, darn a heel or darn a toe and keep the keep the round shape. So all of these lines here you put on mm -hmm. and you learned all that simply by watching a YouTube video. Initially hmm. and then practicing wow. and I did have a basis like I said I um, I embroidered when I was younger Mm -hmm. And this is fun for me. Um, it takes a lot of time and it's very detail oriented, which sometimes is very relaxing because it helps me not think of other things. Mm -hmm. um, but if I also had to milk the cow and make the butter, maybe it wouldn't be as fun. <laughs> but because I can choose, <laughs> I think it's a lot of fun. Well, what else do you have here? Oh, just the different tools that I've picked up. Um, this is another pair I'm working on. And this actually has, I looked. Um, I have a tool that I got from my grandmother. It's a food mill. You, you've seen the mortar and pestle kind mm -hmm. of combo. Mm -hmm. Well, I got that from her, and this felt more fun to use and more practical to use than something really small like this. So th this is just another take on a it's darning... It's just a food mill. It just looks yeah. just like that. Hmm. And I'm doing the, doing the leg on this one, so... Yeah, I can see where you would need to either have some background in needlework or uh, put some, invest some time into watching videos to figure out how to do this. Because I'm looking at it and thinking, I would not have a clue how to do that. Well, it's called duplicate stitch, and you're basically duplicating the, the knit or the crochet. 
I mean, that's what it looks like, a knit mm -hmm. or crochet. And so any type of needlework anybody has done would relate to this. I actually had a birthday party where I had a crafty birthday, mm -hmm. and I taught folks how to do this. Hmm. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. So they went away with a useful skill. Yes. So, um... But it's a, it's a, the reason I got interested is it's about keeping things in service for their intended purposes. We can make arm warmers, we can make dolls, you can make lots of things out of other things, but, but real waste prevention is keeping things in service for their intended purpose. Yeah. And choosing more durable things, things that can be repaired, things that are worth repairing, um, that's kind of my focus right now. That, you know, one of my favorite things to do is to take a garment that ha maybe it's too big or too small and either have it taken in or let out so that I can continue wearing it. Mm -hmm. That makes me so happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if it's something that I haven't been able to wear for a while, it's like getting new clothes. Yes. You know, it's just, it's such a great well, thing. Well, it's exactly like that. And I think we're going to have an aspect of that on that first day of the fair where um, folks can um, swap garments and then upcycle them or take them in right there or get help doing that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, that, so you've actually got a garment swap. That is one idea we're tossing around. One of the volunteers that does garment repair um, mm -hmm. had suggested that idea. So it's something that we're looking at. It's a, it's, it's a type of uh, sharing um, that is happening other places. So mm -hmm. it's something she'd like to try. So are you going to issue a clarion call to all of us to get involved in um, bringing our items back into their intended use or becoming a master recycler or all, all of the above? All of the above. <laughs> well, um, as far as the class goes, um, we have them every spring and fall. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is September 8th. Uh, if you're unable to get into that class, then, then there's always the spring. Do you have a resources page that we can throw up on the screen that has that information? I think that's page two. No, it's not. No, it's not. Page 25. Yeah, let, let's have uh, slide 25, please. And that's just my contact information. So you can go on the Master Cycler website to uh, get an application or you can email me and I'll send you an application via email. Mm -hmm. I can send it to you through the regular mail if you call me, if you don't have access to a computer. Um, if you would like to volunteer for Repair Cafe, uh, the Lane County Fair or, or any other upcoming one, I would um, call me as well or, or get on Facebook and check out what we've been doing there. And you accept um people who are there simply to provide inspiration to others but aren't necessarily experts. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's a it, we're going to have a combination of um, people that do this for a living or have mm -hmm. and hobbyists. So I guess you do I would, hobbyists, I would, the I hobbyist would fall category. in the hobbyist category. But we ha also have this whole other um, category of volunteers, master cyclers that don't necessarily have these skills, mm -hmm. um, who will be greeters and, and uh, kind of meter the traffic and and answer questions. Mm -hmm. So Great. There's, there's, there's room for lots of folks. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. This has been really, really informative and interesting. We really appreciate you being on. My pleasure. This has been Gardening and Beyond, a show for folks who know that soil is a good place to put carbon. Join us next week as we further explore our backyard paradise. <laughs>